Welcome everybody. I'm Abby Garrison. I'm with Chattanooga Neighborhood Enterprise and we want to welcome y'all to uh, the South Chattanooga Rec Center. Thank you to, to everyone here. Um, also want to thank Benwood and Lindhurst Foundations for supporting this effort. So again, a lot of them are here tonight. Thank you to them. And then um, also, thanks for this fantastic turnout. Um, we're a little short on seats, apparently, but there's a few extra over here. And when we get into the group thing, we'll just kind of pile in and pull chairs in and do the best we can. We'll, we'll figure it out as we go. But um, tonight we have Mike Watkins here. He is a nationally acclaimed architect and town planner to talk about St. Elmo and South Chattanooga more broadly and the, uh, the future development of this part of town. So welcome. Thank you. I started doing this town planning work 25 years ago when I walked into a design charrette for a new community up in Gaithersburg, Maryland and volunteered. And for the last 25 years, I've lived in that neighborhood. So I have my office there now and I have about 12,000 neighbors where there used to be a soybean field. I wound up being hired by the firm um, that uh, was doing the master plan for the neighborhood in. It was essentially, um, the uh, town architect there, reviewing the architecture that got built and refining the, um, uh, the design as it got more detailed and so forth. And Vincent Scully paid a visit one time. And those of you who are uh, architects or planners may know Vincent Scully. If you went to Yale, where Vincent Scully taught, you may know of him because he gave, uh, his course there was famous across the disciplines. But he came to Kenlands and wanted a tour. Had never been, but had heard about it and so forth. And he said, well, is there anything about this that's, that surprised you or disappointed you? You know, things that didn't turn, go the way you expected. And I said, you know, we spent so much effort to build a community here that it surprised me that when we have community meetings, people show up and get in heated debates about the place. Things should be done this way or that way, or this should be different, or, you know, I think it should be like this. And he looked at me and he said, well, You've built a place they care about. And I think that's what happens when you have a place that people care about and you announce that you're going to do some master planning in the neighborhood, you get a crowd like this, even when it's 17 degrees outside. So I want to applaud you all uh, for being here tonight, for your commitment uh, to this place. Um, it's clear that there's some passion here for, uh, for St. Elmo. And uh, so I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Two of my, my neighbors across the street um, in, uh, where, where I live and work um, are from Chattanooga originally. And they would always um, be talking about this or that new restaurant or, you know, they come back and visit family and have this great experience and all of that. And, you know, everybody, I love the town I grew up in. You know, it probably takes a little more objective eye, you know, to tell you if it's really a great place or not. So, and when we hear that wherever we go, doing this sort of planning work. We often hear about how special and unique and interesting uh, a place is, you know? And for us, it looks a lot like the special, unique, interesting place we were last month, you know? But I have to say that the city of Chattanooga really lives up to that. Like it's a fascinating, interesting, diverse place that gets great urbanism. And as far as I can tell, Everything everybody's shown me that's happened lately is fantastic. You know, one interesting move after the next. And St. Elmo, even more so. You know, as far as I can tell here in St. Elmo, you have this luxury of out the front door community, out the back door nature. And I can't think of a better way to live. You know, it really is a special, a special place. And what our charge is, uh, this week, there's a team of us here. Because of the size of the crowd, I'm not going to introduce them right now. You'll meet them throughout the course of the week, but I want to give you all a chance uh, to share, so I'm leaving more time for that. But our charge here is to do, um, to prepare a master plan, mostly for the northern section. I'm going to show you the area that we're studying, that we're looking at. Um, and then a detailed plan for some specific places where there may still be opportunities for improvement. Um, and then to look at some of the coding, whether it's simply, uh, you know, you have this great code for the historic uh, area, 
Um, but there's not one really for the commercial area. So there's the possibility of coming up with something there or even um, uh, considering a zoning changes. Okay, I'm going to talk some about that too. So those are some of the things that we will be um, preparing, but we're really your tools in this process. Okay, so we've already had several meetings at, and had one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one meetings with different people around town, individual business owners. We met with a group of merchants this afternoon, a group of residents this afternoon. So we're starting to collect information so we can learn more about your aspirations for this place, how we can be helpful uh, to you all. So tonight what I'm going to do is fly through a series of images here, um, and then we will do our best to break up into small groups generally centered around these tables. But if, if you don't have tables, just make a group. By now I think we're out of facilitators. So we'll have facilitators at most of the tables. And if we've overlooked you, if you would just volunteer somebody to be the facilitator, that would be great. And what we really want the facilitator to do, I'm gonna sort of give instructions as I go through the presentation, think topics and questions, things we'd like to know more about from you. So the facilitator's job would be to simply give everybody a minute or two to share with us their top two or three uh, concerns or issues or things they're excited about with regard to this planning process. And then at the end, with what time we have left, we'll hear from each group so everybody can kind of hear what everybody else was saying. Okay, so the idea is for everybody to get a chance to, to share a few of those things and then we'll share all of that back with the group. Okay, so you know, 15, 20, 25 years ago when we started doing this, this type of... Actually, I need to be able to, um, to look at the slides, and I only have one laser pointer. I can't point to both of them, though. So, um, but there's a couple seats here, so if some of you need to shift over. I'm sorry? Okay. Okay, so, um, okay, so first I'm going to run through a series of comparisons of the form of zoning that is predominant... Uh, that has been predominant for the last 40 or 50 years, producing sprawl. And, and uh, the same types of uses reconfigured in a more traditional pattern. Okay, I'm gonna do that very quickly because uh, as I said, it seems like uh, Chattanooga gets it. But just as a comparison, if this is something new for you all. So this screen shows in, in the top a typical suburban pattern. And you've had a few things slip into St. Elmo that are of this pattern. You know, the big parking lot in front and the, 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 building, the building behind. But um, of the apartment complex, the single family home, cul-de-sac, uh, a school. But here they could all be reconfigured in a pattern like St. Elmo has that's very walkable. You know, the school here is walkable, variety of housing types and so forth. I forget how I'm supposed to advance these. Do I do it from the keyboard? Okay. Okay, so, great, okay, so, I may wind up pointing, okay, so, but excuse me to the people if I have my back to you. Okay, so, that sprawl that wasn't an accident, you know, and it wasn't just evil developers that produced that stuff, it was the law, you know, our zoning codes used to be of this type that isolated each type by use, and then stuck them onto a collector road, and then we were all surprised when the collector road collected all the traffic and we couldn't get anywhere that we wanted to go. Whereas the old pattern used to be much more complex and messy. Um, okay, so the aerial view of the same thing. So um, single family homes, it happens to be Georgetown. <laughs> Sorry about this. Uh, Georgetown over here on the right and then you know homes of different types, which is really to say you know, even different price points or income levels, almost segregated, you know, but in a neighborhood like Georgetown, uh, there's quite a variety of, of housing types in, in close proximity. Um, retail can take very different forms in sprawl. You know, of course, nobody's gonna wanna live next to a 7-Eleven with a parking lot out front, but people live upstairs over a corner store. You know, it has to do with the form of development. Uh, office, office buildings, you can make the same comparison, even at the detail level, and this is something to be careful of because this gets whittled away kind of without notice, but the curb radius at the corner, 
for the most part, traffic engineers are all about keeping the cars moving, right? They just want to keep the car moving. So the softer they can make the turn, the easier the car can get around the corner, but the further the pedestrian has to cross. You know, so if you hear of kind of road improvements of this type coming, you know, fight to save the really tight radius because that's, that's, about, that's about the pedestrian. Even how we deliver services uh, is very different. It's unusual these days to find a place where you go and get the mail. We actually propose that in, in new communities that we're designing, that we have a central post office and the residents have to go pick up their mail. Now, it seems very inconvenient, you know, but it's a great anchor for downtown. Well, it used to be. You know, mail used to be more interesting than it is these days. But, but every two or three days, it's good to go pick up the mail, see what's in there, right? And you run into a neighbor, and you have a chat about what's going on in the community. And then you may go next door and pick up something you need for dinner that night. It's a great anchor in the neighborhood. When we propose that, to our surprise, the post office says with great pride, oh no, you know, we want to deliver the mail to everybody's home individually. I think, all right, well, you know, aren't you having financial issues? Could that be one of the reasons? You know, um, but it's worth, that's worth something worth considering. Civic buildings, you know, in traditional town civic buildings, like this uh, Shepherd's Arms, Shepherd's Arms, I have that right? Shepherd, yeah, has a great location. Like, I don't know whose idea it was to put that on top of that hill, but it looks pretty fantastic up there. We used to be proud of our civic buildings. This is a school on the right here. Not that you'd ever know. Um, okay, and then as the, as the, the, um, the growth pattern got less and less interesting, the architects felt the pressure to make the buildings more interesting. You know, so instead of very simple house, this happens to be the neighborhood I live in, very simple house, just a dumb box with a simple roof, you get something like this. You know, there's enough going on in that roof for a whole village, you know. <laughs> Your architecture, I don't mean to, you know, I, it's, it's quite a compliment for me to tell somebody their architecture is perfectly ordinary. Now, yours isn't. I actually think the architecture in St. Elmo is exceptional in the most delightful way. It's very quirky and idiosyncratic. The buildings have very interesting things going on. That's true for the, the more arts and crafts stuff or, you know, some of the, the kind of Victorian details that you see around. It's just, um, it's, uh, I, I find it very interesting as an architect. Um, another problem we've had is the creation of specialists. So, you know, no doubt the drainage engineer is thrilled with this detail. Never, <laughs> never mind the pedestrian. And here's one for the, the uh, post office. Easy to throw the mail in the box, but you can hardly imagine walking down the sidewalk. You know, this is all about getting the fire truck around the circle. Very important, you know, we need to get fire trucks around, but what we need to appreciate is that it's the, the world in which we live in isn't a single-minded world. It's a very complex world. So you need to get mail, and you need to get fire protection, and you may need to walk down the street. So we all need to work together to appreciate the concerns of one another to pull off, you know, getting the priorities in the right order and the things we need for a great... Um, uh, a great quality of life. Now, one of the things that uh, that I found interesting as I started looking into uh, planning in St. Elmo is that I'm not the first planner to get here. You know, in fact, John Nolan was here. This is the cover of his 1911 report for the city of Chattanooga. He was hired by the Parks Commission to prepare a plan for the whole city. And he mentioned St. Elmo several times. Uh, in this, John Nolan is a fantastic, he's one of the, uh, this, this crowd of traditional planners and architects, he's one of our heroes, our mentor. He's designed a number of, somebody's nodding, so yeah, there are other people who know his work. But he's done uh, neighborhoods and park systems and so forth throughout the country. His recommendation in St. Elmo said, at the present time, the, the plaza at the foot of the incline is a congested and ugly spot. This is 1911. And yet it's one of the natural focal points of Chattanooga. There should be a more liberal opening for the traffic, which centers here, and a more orderly looking approach to Lookout Mountain. You guys are at the foot of Lookout Mountain, and that incline is how you get there. And you know, I wasn't the only one that got here for the first time and didn't notice the incline. 
I'm a pretty sharp guy, you know, but it's for to have something that's so unique and unusual and interesting, um, it deserves a plaza at the base, you know, a special uh, place on the ground. So one of the things that concerns me about, about this, the process this week as a planner from out of town is that John Nolan was a planner from out of town and proposed that 100 years ago. You know, so we've scheduled meetings on Monday to talk about implementation and finance, okay? Because I'm not interested in coming up with lots of great ideas that never get manifested uh, on the ground, all right? We'll talk about some ideas that will never happen as we get to the ones that we'd like to push forward. But we're real interested in making things happen, and I think this idea from 100 years ago is one we should consider. He has interesting things to say about what goes on at the top of Lookout Mountain. And I have a copy of this, if anybody would like to see it. Um, a Hooker Road. There's interesting, interesting things to say about Hooker Road. That's, that's something I'd like a local to educate me on a little bit. Um, <laughs> okay, moving right along. Um, then, there's a, then there's his master plan drawing. And John Nolan understood the value of neighborhood parks, but also a regional park system. And among the things that he proposed were, were parkways along the edge of the river. And then look at this great park system that essentially wraps St. Elmo. So you could take a bike ride through St. Elmo, through all this nature, and back again to St. Elmo, never see the rest of Chattanooga. You know, if you really love St. Elmo, that'd be a delight. You know, so there are some ideas here that that may be worth uh, considering again. Okay, this is an in interesting book. I found several interesting photographs here. In this particular case, there's a great little story about uh, the toy shop, the family that started the toy shop in their house. So this idea of zoning that would allow you to run a business and, and live in the same building, I think is something that's really worth um, worth considering. That's somebody on the other side. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, now a little bit about this incline. There were three interesting old illustrations about this incline. Um, you know, the incline comes down, and then there's this building here that happens to have a gable end, unlike the others. The code, the design code for Old Town Alexandria, said that every private building had to have a horizontal eave to the street. But the public buildings could have a gable end because they're special. So they stand out because they have a gable end. So the Lyceum, the Athenaeum, the fire station, the churches all have gable ends. And you know the thing about the horizontal eave to the street is it binds all of us together in the same way. You know, as individuals, we have the same urban architectural expression to the street uh, as our neighbors. But the buildings we all share are, are exceptional, are special because they have a gable end. This has a gable end. Interestingly, the only one uh, along this street. Um, okay, now in the next photograph, it's also the only place that provides shade on the street, that structure. And I know what it's like here in the summertime. You know, a little shade's you know, pretty welcome. So you're strolling along Main Street here, and it's another special thing about the landing at the incline. Now this is an interesting, uh, uh, interesting comparison because at this point that building is gone. There's some other little thing here in its place, but it really is a gap in the in the urban edge. It's not the only gap, though. Did you notice this? That building is gone too. So we used to have another building in this location, and you've traded that for a parking lot. And we know why, because you traded the horse-drawn carriage um, for more cars. Now, one of the, th the things that I think is interesting about Chattanooga at this point is that you're, you all have broadened the definition of transportation. You know, beyond just cars, or even beyond just pedestrians, there's a whole range of options that are being talked around, about uh, here that I think is very exciting. Um, but we need to we need to consider uh, their impact on the urban. Uh, on the urban character quality of the city. This interesting photograph, not so much for the people, but because you see three corners, buildings that shape three corners. That's tough to find uh, in St. Elmo right now. Um, but it's a sure sign of a, of a place uh, because those buildings shape the public realm. 
Uh, this one I just found interesting because of the, the um, enthusiastic signage uh, on the building. Um, uh, this, this is interesting to me because uh, there used to be, um, with the Hollister's, Hollister's Tourist, formerly something, motel. So you had a motel here. I was surprised to learn. The, the, I've heard numbers between 190,000 and 372,000 visitors a year to Rock City. And you can't put them up for the night? That's a lot of people not to have a hotel or a bed and breakfast or something like that here. So one thing you might consider, and you know the things about, about tourists, they leave a lot of money behind, you know, and then they go back home. They don't put their kids in the school here. You know, they, it's a great uh, uh, market uh, to appeal to. And you may want to keep them here a little longer than they are now. So I think some sort of lodging use uh, would be interesting to consider here. Um, this is all about a festival that used to take place downtown. And I, I threw it in there only to, uh, to remind me to mention the importance of festivals. Because you can have all the great urbanism uh, that you want. Sometimes it's enough uh, to attract people. But there's nothing like great festivals and parties and opportunities to draw people in. So I'd like to learn more about, uh, about those sort of things that you may have going on here that maybe you had going on that aren't any longer and why that is, or that you'd like to have in the future. And you know, the annual things are great because you get a big hit, but you only get it once a year. There are a lot of work to put on. But that Saturday market, you know, happens week after week after week. It's pretty terrific because you get people coming back on a, on a more regular basis. So I'd like to know more about things like that that are going on. Somebody sent me the old Sanborn maps this week. They were really interesting because uh, if you notice, um, I know this is some street that's not paved. It's, it's I think from 1901. But notice the, the edges of the road, how we get down to the corner and the building is totally cattywampus. You know, it's not 90 degrees, it's not behaving. Uh, very well here. Notice here that the, the sides of the roads aren't parallel. They just splay out, that's sort of thing. And then they bend around and intersect at weird angles. It's a complete mess. And absolutely delightful. And it's, it's next to impossible to build a place this interesting anymore. So be very careful about the changes that you're proposing. And you may even consider the, the geometry of, of changes you're making to reflect this uh, sort of geometry. Um, rather than the more, I would say, suburban geometry. You know, the difference really is that people walk in straight lines. We're just efficient that way. You know, but things with wheels move in big curves. You know, the railroad line that used to sweep through the town, or the road that winds up the hill, it's a very different uh, sort of geometry, different character. Okay, so I said we're not the first planners here. The RPA did a master plan here about 2000, 2001 something like that. A lot of great ideas. Um, they begin, though, with this paragraph that says, essentially, none of these great ideas are going to happen if the citizens don't step up uh, and get behind them and even volunteer um, to get some of these things implemented. And one of the encouraging things to me was hearing what an active group of citizens St. Elmo has. I've heard about the email list. Maybe, well, never mind. Um, <laughs> Okay, so in this executive summary, it's a whole list of interesting things that were proposed now, you know, nearly 15 years ago. Uh, encouraging infill housing. You know, the tour I've been given, we saw some, a few examples of that. Uh, uh, streetscape of the business district. Uh, in, encouraging neighborhood-oriented commercial infill. Realigning St. Elmo in Tennessee, which you did do. Although, some of the drawings, it's a really problem. No, we'll get to those. Okay. One of the analysis drawings that they did was about the, excuse me, the condition of buildings in St. Elmo. Uh, we had somebody uh, do another drawing, which was the condition of the frontage, not the individual building, but and when I say frontage, I mean from the face of the building to the curb. Okay, that zone. Does it have a sidewalk or not? Is the porch in good shape? You know, is there shade there? Is the building set way back? So you can't have a conversation with the person on the porch, that sort of thing. And this is just a real quick, rough pass. But as you all are coming in uh, over the next several days, you'll help us refine that. And then what we identify with that are those streets that have the greatest potential to become even better. 
you know, so we focus more attention, uh, more attention on those. This uh, land use map proposed a mixed use zone. Remember I was saying how zoning used to separate all the uses? Well, the mixed use zone is really useful. That's what you've had uh, for so many years, and it's a zoning type um, I think that you should consider. Uh, you should consider again. Uh, this is about mixing residential types. This is the, the <coughs> intersection change that you all made. But I don't think you went as far as this. You, you fixed it for the cars, but if, if I remember out there, um, the crosswalk pattern and the materials in the center of the crosswalk and so forth, you didn't quite get that far with this. And that's something we should talk about if you want that <laughs> or not. How important is that? We having it? This is that curb radius issue that I mentioned. But th this, in this case, the report talked about um, because, I, I forget the percentage, something like 50% of the through traffic in St. Elmo is through traffic. You know, doesn't, doesn't, they don't stop here. Um, so there was a proposal back then of a parkway that swept around St. Elmo so uh, the traffic going through could get to their destination um, more easily. And that's something it'd be interesting to hear more about because, you know, there's a direct correlation, of course, between pedestrian life and traffic. Um, they mix okay, but the traffic has to be going slowly, and through traffic doesn't want to do that. Okay, so implementation we talked about. Now, this was the master plan area for that 2001 plan. Our charge is really this piece uh, up here on the northern end, um, oops, which you see here. So this is generally the area we've been asked uh, to look at. So it's primarily the commercial area, goes up the, the uh, slope a little bit, and then stretches over to Alton Park. Uh, stops generally at the commercial area. <coughs> As I mentioned, you have this, um, well, I haven't read them because frankly there are 150 pages of architectural guidelines. I'm just curious how that's working out because that's a hefty document. Yeah, it is. You know? Oh, okay. <laughs> so that's something we, no, we're not going to change it for the historic district. That's not what we've been asked to do. But what we have been asked to do is to consider um, the possibility of proposing design guidelines for the commercial area. Maybe that's not a good idea. You know, maybe you all don't want that. I'm reminded of a friend of mine who, um, who um, uh, also does these design charrettes. And what he tells the, uh, his crowds, this is Pat Pennell, um, he tells uh, folks that, um, he says, we propose, you dispose. Okay, so we're going to spend a week proposing, and if you don't like it, you know, we'll leave town, and you can toss it all. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen. But sometimes we need to propose things. You know, I tell all my clients this day, if I, don't, if I don't push and give you more and more options until you say no, how will either of us know if we went far enough? You know, we may have left some, some good idea on the table because we assumed you wouldn't want to do it. So it's better for us to throw it out there, and you're going to see some things on Saturday because we've already started having some, some ideas that seem far-fetched and probably unlikely, but you'll tell us, okay? But just know that, you know, just because we propose it doesn't mean it's going to happen, all right? Okay, I'm not going to go into all the details about the architectural standards. Uh, did it, how many of you participated in this Think Bike effort? Very interesting report that these guys, that these guys uh, uh, produced, uh, looking at how bikes might get through St. Elmo. Uh, proposals for one intersection, we may throw a few others into the ring, and perhaps some of you that were there could explain in greater detail um, uh, some of what's behind the ideas um, that we're seeing in this report. Great that they also looked at, but I was impressed that they looked at pedestrian connections as well, because sometimes you can find the consultant that has a, you know, a single-minded issue, and that's pretty much all they look at. Um, but these guys did more than that, which I th commend them for. I love Virginia Avenue. I actually, it's, it's incredibly delightful, charming. Um, tough to get across the street, and they tackled a proposal for how to do that. So uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, um, and if that needs any further thought or not. Um, this was two options for, for the triangular-shaped intersection. I was pleased that they did more than just the circle. The circle's kind of the rage these days, but I have some reservations about circles, because the objective is really about keeping the traffic moving, right? What if you're a pedestrian? You know, you need the traffic 
to stop, not just slow down, but to stop so you can get across the street. And the way these things are often designed is that the crosswalk is placed behind the car that's trying to enter the circle. Because that car needs to be right at the edge of the traffic so they can pull in when they get you know, a short gap. So the pedestrian is expected to get to the corner and walk behind the car across the street and then walk back again. You know, it's kind of extra effort. I have two in my neighborhood. We didn't design them. Um, and you see people walking straight across because, you know, they have common sense. They're going from here to there, not back there, across, and then, you know, back again. So I was pleased to see that they proposed an alternative uh, to a circle there, but interested in your thoughts on that. One of the things that we... This came up since we were hired, just because of the conversations that we've had, that it may be necessary to think a little bit about uh, the type of zoning that you have here. For example, I was surprised in that 2001 report, one of the recommendations was that auxiliary dwelling units uh, be permitted. That's about all you need to say. There's a little more to it than that. But it's not difficult to change that part. It's not difficult to propose that change in a zoning ordinance. You know, and there are some things, if, if you say no more than one per lot, one has to be owner-occupied, that sort of thing, where you can control the negative, usually the perceived negatives of the auxiliary dwelling in it. But I'd like to know why, uh, why that didn't advance, why it didn't move forward. You know, because one of the things we've been, that's been talked about is proposing some changes to the zoning for St. Elmo, so that it, does be, so it doesn't wind up looking um, uh, more like what the, the conventional zoning produces. If you're interested in this zoning question in greater detail, uh, it's something I'm very passionate about. You know, once as a planner, um, you eventually realize that the hard part isn't having great ideas. You know, it's enabling them to happen. And what you run into constantly is the rules don't allow you to do this. Whether it's the street geometry, uh, the zoning, the building code, whatever it is. Yet you stand on the corner and you look down St. Elmo Avenue and there it is, you know? You just want to do that again. But the rules somehow been so, so to produce what you have again, adjustments to these rules may be needed. So just be interested in your thoughts on zoning. Some of the more detailed uh, parts of a, a zoning ordinance that we we'll talk about. <coughs> I, I forget who, we've been getting drawings kind of left and right uh, from folks. I think it was the planning department that gave us a drawing that had so all the buildings colored in this ochre color with a light, very light um, aerial survey behind it. And I asked somebody to, to show me just the buildings. It's really tough to draw the streets in with this. You can't, it's really hard to find any sort of pattern here. Not necessarily good or bad, it's just an unusual observation. Usually buildings form streets or squares or parks or plazas and so forth. But when you look at just the buildings of St. Elmo, it's not quite so clear. On the ground, it's a little more clear in places. The other thing on the ground that's clear is the topography, which is you know, part of the issue, part of why it's so, so unusual uh, and diverse. Um, but one of the things we'll look at is you know, where it might make sense to infill some of the gaps in the urbanism to produce um, to produce a more continuous pedestrian uh, street front. Okay, I think that's it. Yeah, we're going to talk about this more now. Okay, so with that, I wonder how are we doing time wise? Okay, great. Okay, well, there's a lot of people here, and we're going to try to, uh, as I said earlier, hear from everyone. So if if you could group yourself around, more or less, around one of these tables. And if you don't have a table, just in a small group um, with 10 or so other people. And then identify, we had 10 or 12 facilitators already figuring out about 100 people, uh, but um, you exceeded our expectations. Um, so we may need to call on some of you to volunteer. So just get yourselves in a group, identify your facilitator, and then each of you share one or two or three of the things that you think are most important that we consider uh, in this planning process. And then in about 25 minutes, we'll cut that off and we'll hear what the facilitators heard from you all. Sound good? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
things that really came to the top were the the, the character of the, of the neighborhood, preserving that, the uh, idiosyncratic and diverse character of the neighborhood and the houses, the um, concern with the uh, ability to cross into uh, into the South Broad area and crossing Broadway safely and crossing the, the local streets here safely. One of the key issues we were talking about was how to improve connections, sort of the network of connectivity from St. Elmo to Alton Park and Pawnee Woods so that apparently there were a lot of streets that were cut off, there were a lot of connections that were cut off, and there's a total sense of sort of severing off of that area around parts of St. Elmo. And in order for this to help people in Alton Park and Pawnee Woods and begin reconnecting with sidewalks, with bikes, with cars, we need to open that network back up. Uh, we need sidewalks that go out there. We need better transit because they can't use uh, this center, with the, if they don't have better transportation to it, they have issues over there that we talked about as well that we need to think about. Hey, Megan, can you face that direction because there's uh, people that can't hear you. Okay, so we had we talked a lot about connectivity though, and making the bylow sir, bylow and the services around it more walkable and accessible, improving connections to Alton Park. Um, a possible market concept would be useful over here. Sidewalks throughout the connections. Getting through the tunnels is a big problem for people who are coming through here or getting here. Um, for the biking, adding lighting and continuing those biking paths into Alton Park and Piney Woods as well as part of this connectivity. Um, reopening some of the old roads, integrating the bylaw more, um, better environments for kids that come from more sidewalks, more lighting, um, better streets, uh, many of which have been lost in Alton Park from what I'm hearing. Um, these rec center needs to also be connected better to those neighborhoods, better transit connections, and by, uh, by increasing and adding commercial activity in this neighborhood, also possibly enhancing what's available to Alton Park and Piney Woods as commercial activity and opportunities for jobs as well. And the connection to Calvin Donaldson, improving that as well. Okay. Some of the same issues uh, on connectivity to, from the Bilo parking lot and the um, Alton Parks, uh, an economic focus, um, part of that being the tourism and uh, new tourism and keying on maybe some of the historical uh, assets that you have here as well as um, some of the existing uh, assets as trails and park systems that you have make them more visible um, and improve the signage. Uh, I'm hearing a whole lot of, uh, of want for mixed use and, um, and a need for uh, some public transportation so the CARTA system to come down here um, and safer uh, biking and walking, uh, more walkable streets. So that was our table. Some, uh, some traffic congestion issues. I think that's been expressed uh, multiple times, coming up with some ways to make it a little safer and a little, little easier to move around as either pedestrians or bikers in the, in the central business district. Obviously that's going to be a big challenge on, on coming up with some ways to, to do that. Um, uh, guidelines for commercial development, I think that was a big one. You know, obviously St. Elmo has the attention of a lot of people now, including probably some commercial developers. And coming up with kind of an, either an overlay district or something similar to what was done on the North Shore that will offer some type of guidelines as far as what's done architecturally. Um, I think that's going to be very important in the future. Um, transportation options. Uh, I think Carter was just mentioned, you know, having a free shuttle that maybe comes to St. Elmo and, and gives people more uh, accessibility or, or uh, ingress and egress into the, into the area. I think that's important. Um, and then of course just more community gathering places. I think more, more places to to, uh, to spend time with other people, to shop, some boutique uh, retail options. I think the hotel, a boutique style hotel would be a great idea as well, as you mentioned, to, to keep some people here a little bit longer. All right, so my table is back over there, and we talked a lot about uh, connected to connectivity as well, like connecting to a lot of the great green spaces that you have around here, and also walkability downtown. Uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, intersections that are kind of dangerous that make you less willing to walk around the area. 
Uh, we also talked about creating places. There seems to be a lack of uh, like like a focal point that everyone is kind of drawn to. Um, there's also a lot of like great active civic spaces, but um, there's not really like a passive space where people go and hang out and spend a lot of time there. Um, uh, we also talked about taking advantage of underused parking with better parking signage, and there was also um, a desire to beautify the street with like better, more trees um, and undergrounding utilities. So. Great, mainly qualitative and tourism issues, uh, mainly how there's a lack of cohesion in the central business district and there's a lack of an anchor, um, and how also the um, incline should be anchored by places at both the top and the bottom. Um, so St. Elmo should become one of those places and how uh, the use of lodging uh, but not a chain uh, type of hotel, but something similar to the, the crash pad type hostel on South Broad, um, something of that scale uh, to help anchor the um, tourism in that area. Also, uh, improving of frontage, a list of approved street trees, um, and an improvement of a lot of the frontage quality issues, getting rid of the chain link and um, the boarded up windows. Um, also, we spoke about the improving the view of St. Elmo from the incline itself uh, because that's what the tourists see when they're going up. And right now at the bottom, what they see of St. Elmo is the Vilo parking lot and some other unattractive things. Um, and that you don't want that to be the last thing that they remember of your town before they get in their car. Um, and also a uh, specifically protected bike lanes. Um, so some infrastructure for bikes that is separated and protected to make it easier um, and safer to move about. And we talked about Virginia Avenue as being something that has already been proposed for that. The, the big thing was connectivity, 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 connectivity. Uh, connecting to the river walk, developing a bicycle path, uh, linear park on uh, Virginia Avenue connect the residential and business areas to the trail systems on the ridge and on the mountain, uh, potentially extending the downtown shuttle to St. Elmo. Uh, there's some uh, concern about environmental issues, uh, pollution of various sorts from the air to sewage, uh, possibly finding more parking on the block of St. Elmo Avenue between 1885 and Mojo Burrito, maybe making that pedestrian or, or one way, or making it one way possibly. Uh, doing something to draw more attention to the incline from the street, uh, connecting the safe walk to the business district and the other trail systems, uh, better connection between St. Elmo and Alton Park, um, a, a echo the uh, trying to set up some sort of uh, bed and breakfast system uh, for this community and others, and also uh, bed and breakfast as a, as a zoning and management issue uh, for the area. Uh, concern in the residential area about uh, uh, danger in particularly alleys, crime, that kind of thing, uh, and, and how to possibly deal with that. Um, wayfinding, a uh, better signage system to find your way around the community and to find trail systems and also parking, uh, potentially informational kiosks and uh, again, a, just a better signage system. Um, neighborhood support and collaboration, St. Elmo focal points um, such as the incline and sustainable building practices. I'll get into a bit of detail but I'll try to keep it really brief. Um, so, one of the main points we talked about was uh, the incline being a focal point, as I said, and a main gathering place. Also, the um, Vilo seems to be a big gathering place where services are provided, not only grocery, but pick up and drop off for the um, residents using the CARTA system. And as people would, residents would also like to use the CARTA system of the incline, and so they proposed um, resident rates or discounts for uh, locals for the um, incline system and then uh, better access to the trail system through the side of Lookout Mountain 
um, and then also uncovering Hogback Mountain and how that could be utilized for neighborhoods. Uncovering a mountain? Hogback hog Ridge. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm so sorry. Hogback Ridge. Ridge. Okay. <laughs> Just checking. Sorry for what to be referring to. Hawkins Ridge. Um, that Arkansas meeting next week. That's a dead piece. My apologies. Hawkins Ridge. Yeah, I didn't know that. Um, uncovering that and making that a uh, utilized space for the neighborhoods. Um, and then mentioning that, that's right in between um, the neighborhoods of St. Elmo and Alton Park. And then, uh, okay, now I'm on track. Okay, so include Alton Park in the conversations of South Chattanooga. It's a huge component. It's a huge neighborhood. And um, so uh, encourage Alton Park, uh, South Broad, and the neighborhoods around, well, <coughs> encourage St. Elmo and South Broad to bring up Alton Park and work with the neighbors back and forth to increase that community relationship and spend time in each other's neighborhood and work on the connections, the physical connections underneath the railroads and the roadways and the sidewalks which connect the neighborhoods to each other so that it's more comfortable for each other to visit each other and to learn from each other and to spend money in each other's neighborhood. The one road right now, that the primary road that connects these two neighborhoods is, is is predominantly civic uses, the school, the rec center, the post office, the fire hall, and the cemetery. There aren't a lot of people there at night in particular, or the weekends, you know, perhaps more so. You know, so it's, it's not a very, well, lively uh, set of uses along that edge. So it's something to think about. And along that note, one of the ideas that pr was proposed is that um, when developing uses that activate people and people want to come to, think about your neighboring neighborhoods and that clientele and try to appeal to that. And then that will help join the neighborhoods a bit more. So I'll try to make this fast and that's a good apply. Um, so pedestrian access throughout the neighborhood to the main points where people do need to get to. And then we get to increasing the amount of community gardens, Sustainable housing stock, creating sustainable housing stock, and promoting qualities for ecotourism in that, and increasing local businesses incubation in small local stores in the area instead of as a big box uh, that might come and go and leave a big box. What we really focused on in terms of Alton Park and Plum Alton Park, okay. and we want to make sure that there's not a continuous effort to isolate us. When you isolate oh. people, you bring on all different kind of variables, crime and all the other stuff, and, and, and food deserts and all that stuff that goes with it. Please find a way to make the coordination as complete as we can possibly can. Now, I made the point that I've just returned back home, been gone 27 years. I'm embarrassed to ask my colleagues to come to Alton Park as a, as a tourist attraction. What am I going to, what, what am I going to invite them to? So when I bring my colleagues to Chattanooga, I want there to be a multiplicity of things with all the part being included that we can do to entertain outside people. If you do that for us, I guarantee you we won't have that isola isolationism that breeds a whole lot of other different kinds of things. So make that part of your plan, please. This word connectedness has come up repeatedly. You know, more than one table has mentioned that. And you might be... Um, are reassured to know that uh, when Abby gave the team uh, the sort of executive summary of the reasons that the Chattanooga, Chattanooga Neighborhood Enterprise <laughs> brought us here, she summed it up by saying, the real issue is connectedness, you know, which I thought was pretty, you know, like, you've been doing your homework. <laughs> yep. We also talked about um, connecting the rest of St. Elmo to the to the business district and not just the Virginia Avenue Greenway possibility, but also making sure that our sidewalks are intact and that um, it's, uh, it's a very walkable neighborhood, but there are barriers to that, especially to people who aren't as, as mobile as some of us are. So we talked quite a bit about that. Um, another big one at this table was design and zoning, which I know has, has been mentioned, but um, 
uh, keeping everything in character with the things about the neighborhood that we love, and also looking at um, some of the signage and uh, visual clutter that we have in the downtown right now, uh, uh, doing something about that or keeping it to a minimum. Um, and then uh, probably our other big one was uh, multiple use, multimodal use of, uh, of our roads. Um, looking in particular at the, at the downtown area, there would be some changes to St. Elmo Avenue that have been mentioned as far as uh, making it perhaps one way, uh, using retractable bollards uh, to close off uh, the section that, uh, of St. Elmo that runs between uh, the two main buildings there with the merchants. Um, and <coughs> space and inventory for more merchants uh, was, was a big one that was also mentioned. And I think that's pretty much it for us. I was with a group of planners and engineers in the back. Um, in addition to what everyone else has said, traffic was obviously one of the biggest issues for our group. One thing in particular was the Tennessee Triangle problem, and that's important not just for connecting St. Elmo and Alton Park neighborhoods, but also to encourage greater use of our civic facilities by St. Elmo residents. So we mentioned more involvement in Calvin Donaldson, greater use of the recreation center and other facilities. So fixing that problem could help go a long way. Um, another issue, we would like to see a commercial node within the neighborhood. So we love our town center, but we also need some more activity in the neighborhood instead of just a swath of single family houses. It's so exceptional to say that we want we want something commercial in our residential neighborhood. That's fantastic. St. Elmo is very, a lot of residents want multimodal transportation options and it helps if there are things you can actually walk to. So for those on the end of the neighborhood, it's a 30 minute walk to the town center. So having more things to walk to would help us. Um, also, we've got in St. Elmo have incredible natural places to go to and open spaces, but we need more signage and wayfinding to things like Gill Trail. So that was another big point for us. Great. We knew the, the Bilo Plateau and connecting it with uh, St. Elmo um, the, in the center. Uh, the tunnel, having access through the tunnels for pedestrians and bicycles and improving the lighting there was a big issue. Just uh, better intersections when it comes to connecting Virginia Avenue and crossing Ox and then eventually uh, getting uh, Tennessee crossing, uh, St. Elmo crossing Broad Street for future connection to the River Park. Um, the Tennessee uh, Avenue Triangle up here uh, was, a, was a big issue in getting connectivity for pedestrians down to the St. Elmo area proper. Um, um, making uh, the uh, traffic lights for pedestrian crossings more visible sometimes during the daytime. Uh, they don't show up very well and they're not paid much attention to. Uh, just getting more connectivity between the uh, different green spaces in the area. Um, one that uh, I, have, I really haven't heard mentioned yet, but creating an alternate route for the large amount of hazardous materials that are transported through St. Elmo from the gas tank farm at the end in, in Georgia, straight down to the north of St. Elmo. That's a large amount of uh, hazard materials trafficking through there every day. And, uh, you know, continue more of uh, Carter access. Uh, the current bus system is going to stop early uh, for St. Elmo proper. There's still an off park bus, but improving the uh, Carter connectivity, maybe free shuttle access and those kind of things. So, we thought that uh, the trails were good, but the trails were not particularly connected with one another and not signed particularly well. And we're hoping that the river walk as it comes in will begin to give us a network uh, of trails. A recurring thing in my group was fitness. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, walking and biking and getting around the neighborhood in ways other than driving was, was a big part of it. Um, there are places in and around that, that where it's difficult to bike. We didn't mind cars as long as the trip.
traffic is managed and it is slowed to the point where pedestrians and bikers can compete with it. It can speed up once it leaves, but it needs to be managed coming through the district. We were concerned about design consistency, both in the commercial district, some unhappiness about the strip centers next to the historic buildings and getting a consistency about that. And we recognize that there are probably going to be some new uh, residential in especially the north end where there is some vacant land uh, closer to the railroad track and around the Bilo, but that it, it should have height restrictions and should be, what is new should be in keeping with what we already have. Um, in our, the big, oh, the traffic, the truck traffic, especially on the, on the south end came up. I don't know what to do about that, but there's a, there's a lot of it and, uh, and that seems to be uh, not a good thing. Finally, our best suggestion, I think, that has not been mentioned was a new middle school that would join both of the neighborhoods, both Alton Park and into the same way. My table was in the back, and again, uh, yeah, and again, connectivity. Everyone was really excited about the potential for creating better multi multimodal options and making it safer for pedestrians and cyclists, specifically in the commercial corridor. And, Connections to Alton Park, which we've heard again, and, and um, everyone was excited about the opportunity to connect those two neighborhoods. Um, particular intersections of concern were uh, Tennessee and South Broad in terms of both safety for cars, but then also for bikes and pedestrians, and then Ox Highway up, up the mountain in that intersection. Um, there was a lot of talk about zoning and again working to preserve that historic and unique character but also recognizing that um, if there are going to be new buildings that it doesn't necessarily need to be fake historic like there's a way to make it authentic to St. Elmo without having to enforce things that aren't necessarily um, already there. Um, there's a lot of talk about mixed use so really wanting to have more mixed use, wanting to have more lifestyle businesses and more things that people can walk to and, and stay in the neighborhood but you know support their general lifestyle. Um, connections to Bilo as a major service hub, um, potentially expanding the electric shuttle as transit to St. Elmo and again connecting that tourist aspect and of course everyone was really excited about the river walk and there, there was some talk about thinking about branding for St. Elmo and using sort of unique art elements to, to brand the neighborhood. You know, there, there, there's good historic replication, you know, where it's really excellent workmanship. Um, it just happens to have been done more recently than, you know, than the buildings next door, let's say. Um, and then there are also bad modern buildings. So for me, the issue isn't as much old or new as it is good or bad. Um, and there's nothing worse than, than a new building doing a bad job of looking like an old building. Uh, so, but, but whoever came up with that, if you'd let me know, because that's a, a much longer a conversation. And, okay, great, thank you. All right, I'll look, I'll look you up. First was open William Street Tunnel, which runs beneath the railroad track, which was graveled in by the railroad in the new path. Extend Cummings to uh, this new extension of Williams that would come through that tunnel. Uh, there was there was a lot of emphasis put on being able to rezone if, if there's rezoning that you should be able to live in the business part of town, right in the in the, in the part of town. Uh, the connection that's been mentioned a lot about the Bilo, I like the word plateau that was used. I thought the Bilo plateau was great. Oh, okay. It just sounds more beautiful <laughs> yeah. than it is. It sounds wonderful. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, but about a pedestrian connection from from low up to high there. Uh, also, the, the north end of uh, Virginia Avenue, there's just a, a, a real disconnect when you're, you're going up through there and you get there, there's no place to go once you get to the northernmost part of it. Uh, there was a, a feeling that Ben Miller Park should be enhanced to make it more vibrant. Uh, let's see, there was a consensus about no big change hotels. Uh, and uh, a really, uh, a lot of a lot of enthusiasm for Virginia Avenue slash Beulah Greenwood, and then it was also valued by everyone that long term I guess would be uh, 
an alternate traffic route for food truck. And my group, which was this, the front table here, um, said the same thing about an alternate route for the, the truck and through traffic. The importance of attracting young families. You know, Abby had two of the best firms out there uh, do market studies. One was um, for a residential study to see who's likely to move here, how many houses you might expect in the next three to six years and of what type. And the other firm did a commercial study to tell us about um, the gaps between where you all are spending your money and the local businesses to help us understand what types of businesses might fill those gaps uh, and what size stores they are and so forth. Um, uh, so we've got that study with great information. One of the things both studies pointed out is that the population that lives here and is likely to come here is weighted more heavily um, toward uh, younger singles, I'm sorry, younger couples and singles and older folks. Generally, the segments of the population that don't have kids uh, in school. And you know, there's the chicken and egg situation about whether that's because of the schools or you know, if you had those uh, younger families, the schools would get better. So that's a conversation uh, that we need to have too. But, but my group talked about the importance of attracting uh, young families and you can't do that without school. So that led to a conversation about what might be done with the school next door. We've uh, met with the county uh, superintendent of schools and um, learned about how they use that building. It's generally overflow, uses things that don't fit in their other buildings kind of wind up there. And you go in and look around and it, it, it looks like that. It's this random collection of, of mostly unrelated things. Um, so there may be opportunities to consider other uses for that. Someone in the group said uh, a school that, um, that focuses on Appalachian arts could be a high school, could be a community college, but I thought that, was, that would be interesting and goes with the diverse and kind of uh, interesting character of St. Elmo. Uh, another one that came up was the quality of the infrastructure, that if we're talking about making changes to any of the roads, it may be important to consider what's going on underneath in the form of uh, stormwater management and sewer pipes and water pipes, because there's no point in paving, oh, I see a lot of heads nodding, no point in paving over bad infrastructure. So there may be some investment that needs to be made you won't see right away, you know, until you get the stuff underneath fixed and then do what's on top. A stormwater management was an issue. You know, somebody described their, the, the, the holding area in the building, uh, underneath their building, um, and the uh, issue that that creates, um, the, the need for guest houses and zoning that allows it. Um, let's see. Oh, somebody told us a little about the, the wall drug that's since been covered up with concrete block and the interesting sign that they used to have out, out in front of the store. Um, and that uh, kind of a character loss there when those changes were made and the importance of, of retaining uh, more of that. Okay, so with that, we're gonna talk just for a minute about the, uh, the schedule for the week, and then I'm gonna let y'all go. This was great. Uh, exercise. Um, a lot of overlap and then also ideas that were um, that were kind of unique to the various groups. Thank you. So so tomorrow we have, first of all let me say that um, any of you are welcome at any time. Okay? So feel free to stop in and check out what the designers are doing or sit in on a meeting that's going on. Now some of the meetings have a particular emphasis. So it's not a free-for-all where we're going to talk about anything at any time because we want to make sure we cover certain topics. So on this schedule, which I'll leave up as, you, um, as you're leaving, you can check it out. Um, it describes the topics uh, of those meetings. And then we have sessions. Those, those are in yellow. So the one on Saturday is at? Two. Two. Thank you. Is it two where we'll, we'll have some things to show you? Typically, we pin them up. Uh, on the wall and you look at the actual drawings, but with the crowd this size, we're gonna to need to use uh, the PowerPoint I can see already. So we'll be presenting uh, some early ideas. They'll be, you're seeing the process. We just landed yesterday, you know, so you're really seeing uh, the process unfold. So don't come expecting, you know, beautiful color renderings or computer generated <laughs> fly through models. We're not there yet. You know, this really is just the beginning uh, the beginning of this process and you'll see things that don't work and some things we've left out and 
I'm sure I can count on you to let us point those things out to us. Let us know. Uh, the only day that we'd rather you not come um, is um, on Monday afternoon because we have another presentation on Monday evening. Um, and, you know, architects love to work right up to the last minute. In fact, that's where the term charrette comes from. Uh, there was a school in Paris that taught architecture in the late 1800s, and they, they used to take a cart, the charrette, uh, around the city and collect the students to take them to school. You know, they had big drawings to carry, and that's why the paintings, actually. And they would all take them all to the school so that they could be reviewed by the, uh, by the professors, but the students were never quite done. You know, so here they are bouncing around in this cart trying to finish things. That were, so somewhere along the line, this short, intense work session came to be called a charrette. That's where that comes from. So give us, give us a little break. Um, uh, do I have the days right? Monday afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. So that we can uh, be better prepared for you all Monday evening when you return again at 6.30. Uh, if you like to see more of the ideas that we come up with. And even that's not the end. That we'll leave the next day on Tuesday, but then we'll go back to our office and then uh, uh, spend more time uh, refining the ideas and so forth and come back and make another presentation, uh, date unknown at this point, but we'll, get, we'll send you an email um, uh, to your listserv and get the word out uh, so you can join us then if you like. Anything else, Abby? I think I would only add, if anybody's on Twitter or Facebook and has more questions or comments or something comes to you later on, feel free to tweet us, Facebook us. We're at C-N-E-I-N-C. -E so C-N-E-I-N-C -E is our handle. Hashtag, I need to remember the hashtag, ideas for St. Elmo. Okay, thanks for coming tonight.